for inviting me and, and for a lovely uh, introduction as well because actually I want to take up some of those themes about what a fantastic discipline we work in um, and how successful we've been over the years which is actually going to create our next set of challenges because pretty much everything we've built over the last 40 years is still running. Um, it all needs to be connected together, it needs to work in today's world with today's standards um, and uh, this is what <coughs> most businesses are spending all their time on is dealing with the legacy and trying to move forward as a result. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the way that we move technology forward, the things I've seen. So I've been at IBM for 30 years. Um, inside that time, I mean, we're encouraged to move jobs every three or four years. So I've started assembly programming, a mainframe. Then I moved to Unix systems, and we did the first transaction system. Um, and at that, in that time, people said, there's no way you can run a business transaction off of a mainframe. It's impossible which seems an incredible thing to say when you think about how nowadays that you know, most businesses run on, um, on Linux and, and uh, other types of uh, and, and, and Windows types machines. So although the mainframe is still very significant, there's, you know, there's, there's many other choices that. After that, um, that work, uh, where we got Kix transactions running on a Unix box. I then moved to um, open technology and I did one of the first commercial implementations of the um, Corbett OTS, the um, Object Transaction Service. And there we were proving that you could use object technology and um, sort of RPC type um, integration to uh, perform two-phase commit transactions. After that, I moved to um, building a uh, uh, a workflow system running with Java Beans for a J2EE environment. Um, and then um, did a little bit with workload management, moved on to um, uh, event management, um, and then finally into data management. So here I started working on metadata, master data management, um, and information integration. So you can imagine that in that time, I've seen an awful lot of systems and different technologies. Um, and it's enabled me to have a perspective on how the standards around this technology change continuously. I've got a problem with the mic. <laughs> or is it OK? Yeah. No. Um, how, how, the, the, um, how the technology evolves and what impact it has on the resulting systems. Because the reason that we're successful is not because our technology is cool but it's because we deliver results. We actually make change. We, we, we enable things that were impossible. And the results of that is that the level of complexity we deal with, we've never built things as complex as today's systems in any other field. Um, and that's why we do experience errors. We do experience overruns on our projects because every time we're inventing something new. Now, there may be um, the... Uh, uh, there are many of us who think that we should actually probably be a little bit more standardized in our common ways of working. Um, and the open source movement, again, something that's very, very different um, from any other industry is that many practitioners give up their own time to build open source software that's then freely available. And there are many people who passionately care about the accuracy and the quality of that code. Um, and so there's an awful lot of eyes on that code. And that's the thing I've been impressed. I've been working with the open source teams for a um, about six months, and even in that time, the, the, the attention to detail is absolutely phenomenal. So um, I'm uh, very, very proud to be part of this industry. So let me talk a little bit about um, a little bit about uh, the sorts of things I've seen over the years. Uh, this is a little bit about me. These are my books and uh, my titles, but I think you've heard enough of that. Um, now, whenever we predict the future, we're always taking a risk of looking <coughs> foolish. And of course, the, ones, the things that people say that are wrong are the ones that everybody remembers. So um, my favorite one is, of course, uh, there'll maybe be space for five computers. Um, and then, of course, uh, Bill Gates saying, we're really not going to need much more memory than we have today. So it's always dangerous to say, we don't need any more. It's about right now. Um, but the reason that these predictions there weren't, these, these aren't stupid people, right? <laughs> these predictions go, uh, uh, become um, ridiculous because the assumptions behind them change. So when that first one was saying that um, there may be a need for five computers, that was because it took a building to run the computer. 
and there's not many people who could afford that building and that infrastructure. So that's why, whoops, I think one of the mics are not picking up. Right, that's because that, and, and that's why that prediction was completely wrong because the nature of the system behind you know, the computer actually was greatly simplified um, as we moved away from valves. Um, so, and the same with the memory, okay? Um, the reason we need so much more memory and storage is because of the way we write software. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those trends and why they're happening um, and uh, creating this continuous need for, for more hardware um, to run the systems that, that we run. My, my first system, hardware uh, memory was so expensive that we actually used to swap storage around. So when a module was called, we would actually overlay its data on top of the previous module that was called and we would be constantly swapping the pages around because it was too expensive to put all of the memory for the program in um, actually live at a single time. And we also, the address of the program and all the storage only took three of, out of four of the bytes, so we used to store data in the top byte as well. And that just shows you how much work we would spend to make the absolute maximum use of the memory. Now, you wouldn't do that today. That would be absolutely ridiculous. But it's the sort of, when you change the underlying assumptions, then, of course, you enable new types of capability. So we need to be careful. So I'm going to make a fool of myself, no doubt. Uh, you'll think about this in the future and say, why did you say that? <laughs> now, um, one of the few predictors that has been astoundingly and surprisingly true has been the view of the speed at which uh, chip technology has improved over the years. And this is Moore's law. Um, and it shows the exponential, um, I say growth, but the redu exponential reduction in the size of, um, uh, of uh, transistors and the ability to, uh, and how packed, tightly packed we can, we, we can, we can bring them. Um, and all of that has created um, much of what we do today and much of the industry and the ability for us to have the impact that we do. Um, because we're not spending all our time filling the top byte of, of our addresses. You know, we actually can get, um, afford to have higher level languages that allow us to express the problems much more effectively. So we're, we're much, more, you know, much more efficient. Um, so that ch constant change has allowed us to constantly evo evolve and, um, and improve um, our technology. Now, on the other hand, we also have very short memories. Um, and so in the, t in the last 30 years, I've noticed continual reinvention of the same thing. Trying to create the simple answer to something that's actually very complicated. And by doing it, just ignoring the other part of the problem. So we end up with a pendulum swing between, well, we have to have strongly typed interfaces so that we can compile errors out of the code before we go, no, no, strongly typed interfaces are way too much work. We need to have everything that's parsed at runtime so we can be flexible and have adaptable systems. And then, and, you know, and then, then there's another one. So at the moment, uh, I had a, someone explain to me the, the beauty of, of uh, an interface definition language and protobuf as if it had just been invented, even though we've had many, many iterations of trying to create strongly typed interface contracts. So, you know, each of them have their value, but actually at some point we're going to have to stop swinging from pendulum to pendulum and start to create that middle ground where we can support stateless and stateful together, strongly typed and weakly typed together, because every problem has that essence of the two. And I think that's the challenge for us, that this simple, easy approach is the thing that, that, that we're, st we're struggling with. But what seems to happen is that we're constantly, you know, we try and fix one problem by simplifying an area, and it creates problems in another area, and then that goes through a simplification process and change. And so we're cycling between changing the way we do processing, changing the way we manage data, changing um, the infrastructure, which of course is, is growing and improving all the time, and this is impacting the people, the skills we need, the way we interact with, uh, with systems, um, and the impact it has on society. So and this, this cycle is continuously moving. Um, so hardware, of course, um, as I said before, this is, this is our enabler. This is creating space, the, the, the capacity to, for us to explore and expand what we do. So it is a, a key part. And, and actually, at the moment, we are being frustrated largely by physics, <laughs> the speed of light. So you know, there's a limit to how fast we can get data off a disk, and it's limited by the speed of light. 
So we have to do tricks, which is compress data, so that you know, we can get more data out in a, in a particular period of time. Power is another problem. So much of the hardware research is around how do we run on much lower power? Because the data, you can build a new data center, but you have to build a new power plant to go with it. And so this is becoming a, a key problem in many developed societies in that we don't have enough power to run the data centers we want. So um, reducing the amount of power, so server consolidation, all that type of thing, is, is really becoming critical in today's, uh, in today's world. Um, now, of course, as I said before, we've kept everything. So um, many of the customers I deal with have thousands, hundreds of thousands of systems dating back, some of them are 40, 50 years old. There's nobody in the company that knows that code anymore. Um, however, it's running the core business. Um, and it's very true in many of our industries that have been computerized for many years. Um, and because a business wants to appear coherent, they have to send the data between the systems. So in the, when, when computers were first put in, you put in a computer to automate this administration process and then you'd automate this one over here. And you'd have a different system going in, and they would be independent. Um, and there would be an expectation that um, you know, a, an organization would do one, one product, um, and that's, then they would have a department supporting each one. In today's businesses, there are many thousands of products, typically. Um, and a thing called the internet has allowed people to log on to a business's systems so that customers are logging onto their systems through the website. This again was a change in the 80s and it meant that suddenly people expected, well I've got three bank accounts with you, a savings account, why do I have to have three logons, one for each account because they happen to be managed by a different system? Um, they, um, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, so they expect these things to be integrated. And I'll talk a little bit more in, the, in a minute about why that is incredibly difficult to actually integrate the data for multiple systems. But nevertheless, in order for a, an organization to operate today, there is an expectation that they present this clean, consistent view of themselves to the world, even though their systems are implemented like this. And this is a, this is a picture from a UK bank. It was done about 10 years ago. It's page one of two, and these are their systems. And within a system, it, there will be um, multiple computers connected together and, and, and operating. Um, so the, the, con the complexity and the interconnectivity is well more bigger than an individual can understand. And this is one of our challenges, is that much of this stuff is incomprehensible to, to, to even the best human uh, going. And yet we have to prove that these systems are correct. So um, there's this constant search for the easy button. How do we make how do we how do we make programming simple enough to um, get more programmers into the business? So we keep we've created high-level languages. We've created something that's been very popular for the last ten years, and we've had multiple goes at this. Create some sort of scripting and wrapping technology to allow existing systems to be called as if they're functional code. And we've had the service-oriented architecture. At the moment, we've got the microservices architecture, which is um, very, very similar, um, but people are writing books on the differences, which shows you how, un you know, how similar they really are in the fact that we have to have a book to explain the differences. Um, but what it's effectively doing is breaking down um, functions and encapsulating the data close by. So it's making the problem of integration of data in systems worse um, because it's breaking it down even more. And, and our programming languages do this. Our programming languages are highly focused on function. And think of an object-oriented program. You put the data inside the object and you don't let anybody access it. And that's all fine as long as that data is truly private to the program. But for example, you think of a business their customer data is needed in almost every system they have. So is their employee data, so is their product data. And so we end up copying it um, continuously. So when you look at, um, look at a model of all the, take all the different data types an organization has, and you show how they're connected together, you have what we call an enterprise data model. And when you look at the shape of it, what you see are, there are certain objects that look like spiders. 
And this is the objects that everything is connected to. And that's the nouns, basically. Customer, employee, product, asset, all of those. We call these master data. And they are literally, everything you do is because an employee needs it, a customer needs it, it's to do with the products you sell, it's how you collect your money. It's every part of the business are, are surrounded by these, these master objects. Now, if we then, now, so what, was, and, and often, you know, if you, if, you, if you just had one system, it would be quite nice. It would be very easy to take that and then create a complete view of who your customer is, who your employee is, what's happening to your products, etc. But the reality is that because the systems have been put in one system at a time, one for each product, one for a customer support center, one for customer service center, one for the customer accounting, etc., etc. If you actually overlay the systems, each system has a subset, but every system has those master entities in them. And they're each developed independently. So the copies aren't synchronized. Um, so you open a bank account, you give them your current address. Ten years later, you open another bank account, say a savings account with the same bank, you might give them your new address. Unless they're doing something special, your other account doesn't have its address changed, right? Because it's a completely different database that's operating. So there's an awful lot of work going on to actually synchronize the data, so you only have to tell them your address has changed once. And even then, people don't keep their data up to date. I mean, if you change your mobile phone, you get a new iPhone, new number, do you phone up every company you've ever given your number to to make sure that they keep their data up to date? Of course you don't. So data is actually decaying continuously, particularly data about people and particularly data about customers. So we know that um, it's fragmented, inconsistent, and probably wrong. So, uh, and this is the data that businesses are operating on. Um, so here's a, just an illustration of why this is so difficult. So imagine this data has come from three systems. It's a retailer like Amazon, and they've got one system where you log on on the web, and here's Alistair Stife's web logon, with, and, it, and the ID is his email address. The next one is a system where the orders are made, and the primary key is the order ID, and the person who it's for is uh, is like a secondary field. And then in the next one is the store card. And here the account number looks like a credit card number. Um, and, um, and then of course um, his name is there. Now what you notice is there's a subtle difference in the spelling of his name in each one. The primary key is, is different in each one. And the address of course isn't a unique identifier and it's often spelt and, or formatted slightly different in each system. So the real question is, what are you matching against when you do these types of, uh, when you do these types of merge? It's really not easy. <laughs> um, and um, this is why companies spend so much money trying to bring your data together in the systems that they've created because um, of this envir environment. And typically we have special hubs and all they do is each system feeds its data in and it gets a corrected copy back. And inside that hub, it's keeping the identifiers and linking them together um, to create a view of, of all the identifiers you have in that organization um, to, uh, to create that single view. And most of the time it works. Occasionally, you find your records being merged with somebody else's, um, and it creates some interesting, um, interesting um, problems and unpicking it. The other thing we find is that within a system, the data is rubbish as well. Um, and there's lots of duplication. So this system is about assets that are for hire. And so the people's name and address is a secondary field. And so you get inconsistency even within, within, within a, um, a piece. And, and people use, um, I won't get this here, but, but also fields are used inconsistently. So um, we have one customer who used to use the fifth line of the address for messages for the postman because it was printed on the envelope. So beware of the dog used to be in the address field, right? <laughs> Quite reasonable. <laughs> um, and because people are ingenious, if your system doesn't do everything it needs to do, they will find a way to do it. Um, and misuse of address fields and other data fields is actually incredibly common. And when we look at the database behind an application, we really understand how it's being used in a way that asking the end users how they use the system 
well, um, you'll never know, but the data doesn't lie. Um, but it always means that when you take data from a system, you have to be incredibly suspicious of its database schema because it doesn't actually reflect exactly what the data is. Um, <clears throat> so when we're bringing this data together, there's a whole discipline around uh, managing data. So when we talk about quality, there's actually no such thing as quality data. It's very relative to the way you're using it. Um, and sometimes very poor quality data is absolutely adequate. And <coughs> other times, the, say the precision isn't good enough. The completeness isn't good enough. Um, it might be every record's accurate, but there's only half of them there. So um, when we talk about quality, we actually have to be quite precise about what we really need in order to use data in a particular way. And then these are the different disciplines that we use for actually sorting data out to deduplication, semantic reconciliation. So if you've got two medical systems and they both have a field called gender, is that the same type of gender? And that's what we mean by semantic reconciliation. Do these two fields have exactly the same meaning? Um, Cross-referencing, um, we match data. I talked about how difficult it is to match and link data together. Standardizing, so taking address fields, and in one system it might be three um, fields, it might be 10 in another, it might be one in another. How do we standardize it so addresses look the same when we're matching them? And enriching is filling out things like putting the postcode into the address, that type of thing. Now, when we actually process data, we can't do this just on type. Um, so, for example, if we were dealing with information about health records or illnesses, data about the fact you've got a cold or flu is actually not very sensitive, but data about the fact that you've got AIDS is both of these are diseases, but they have to be treated in very different ways. And that's something that our programming languages are really not very good at, is, um, dealing, is, is having different behavior for um, data that appears to be of the same type. Um, the other thing is when we're matching, the frequency of data matters. So if you've got two records for John Smith, um, you wouldn't necessarily think that they were for the same person. But if you had two records for somebody called Bartholomew Virgil Fence Post, you'd probably think that that was the same person. So the frequency of data matters. If we add in their date of birth and their address, so we've got two John Smiths living at the same place with the same date of birth, again, we increase our confidence that this is the same person. Um, but of course, there are twins and things like that. So there's, there's always a doubt. Um, and then, say um, the, uh, these were the two dates of birth. Is that the same date of birth or a different date of birth? Depends on which comes first, more Exactly. So if one, come, one system's located in America, one's located in Europe, then they could be the same name. So this is the standardization issue. So you've really got to understand what the source of the data is um, as, as we do this. We then get to the point of analytics. There's a massive amount about AI and machine learning. And when I was at college, uh, there was a thing called the fifth generation computers that everybody was terrified about, that they were going to take over the world and completely, um, you know, completely remove all programming and things like that. As you probably realize, that didn't quite happen. Um, and it was partly because the technology, the machines weren't powerful enough to do it. But the real problem is, and the thing that we still haven't solved today, is, is, is how we get data to these algorithms. How do we get data to the people who are going to build the algorithms, and how do we get data to where the algorithms need to run in a way that actually we're comfortable, that we understand what the um, analytics is doing, um, and uh, that we can, you know, that we know that the, the world's not going to blow up because we've got using AI. So <laughs> when we build analytics, it's actually we need two sets of data. To actually design the, the algorithms and configure the models, we need to ha have historical data to understand the patterns and how they change. And then when we run the model, we need the today's data for the model to do the prediction. So you imagine two very, very different systems. We need a, a very data-oriented system that's gathering and history from everywhere. And then we need the operational systems that are tucked into where the decisions are needed to be made. This is why we end up with this life cycle. Um, and the way that data has been collected for analytics has, has changed a lot over the years. So here you imagine these applications. This is the systems that do the business. So manage bank accounts, you know, um, collect orders, collect money from, from customers. 
Um, often the data from these systems um, is consolidated into what we call an operational data store so that we can run analytics and understand what's happening across multiple systems. This has the current values. And then we keep a historical count in what we call a data warehouse. And this is a system that's trying to create a coherent view of what's happened in the organization. And it's used for accounting and reporting to regulators. Uh, so that's what the data warehouse does. And then we do analytics off the back. So the, the pattern discovery piece is the analytics piece. And then we create reporting data marks for the business to actually see how profitable the business is or whatever. And here the data is flowing. And so we're doing all our analytics and reporting on historical data and data that's been manipulated and matched and, uh, and, and purified effectively. So the business operates on this dirty data and uh, we report on this clean data, which you can imagine is, is not the best. Uh, but that's what we've been doing um, up until about um, probably five or six years ago. Um, and um, the other thing we've been doing is putting in these master data management systems that actually start data flowing in two directions and really start cleaning up the data in the operational systems. And then somebody invented Hadoop, or they, they made it open source. And so systems, people started putting in these Hadoop systems to be able to process um, a lot of unstructured data. Now what you can see is every time I click the, um, click the button, there's huge amounts of data being integrated and sent between different systems. And it becomes increasingly complicated to understand where your data is, particularly you imagine sensitive data about your financial situation, personal data, um, it's flowing all over the place um, and is uh, becoming increasingly difficult to keep track of. So um, we've invented something called the data lake um, and this is a system of systems that basically creates a managed area where we've got different data platforms that are processing um, large amounts of data for analytics. Um, and we use different systems because each have different um, non-functional requirements and non-functional requirements to drive the, uh, the way that we manage information because there's a constant conflict between do we centralize all our data and access it together? That can cre create um, yeah, a lot of uh, network traffic. It also means that the schema of that central system is very difficult to change because there's so many systems dependent on its structure. Or do we decentralize it? That means that you have high availability on your data. It's just there for you. It's structured for you. But of course, you have this issue that you might have out of date data. So there's this constant balance between the two. And so we're always running multiple platforms that are supporting different, <coughs> no, um, di different um, workload requirements. So the data lake provides that environment. And then, of course, we've got now mobile devices, which in themselves are computing platforms. They are not like browsers. They are collecting data. They are um, their own user interface. They have their own network connectivity. They um, have many different types of sensors within them. And then we're adding sensors everywhere. So there's another set of data deluging into the organization. Um, and we start to separate the systems and think about them um, in, oh, sorry, this is the, the thing is coming in. We start thinking them about them in, in four different groups. The systems of insight, that's the data lake in the middle. That's, with all, that's where your data warehouse, your uh, Hadoop system that's doing that analytical processing. We've got the systems of engagement. These are mobile devices typically. <coughs> and they represent an individual's view of the world. So their medical records, their work relationships, their um, shopping, et cetera, et cetera, their family. It's all there and it's all about them. And then there's different applications connecting into different systems. Systems of automation, these are the um, Internet Things applications. They're about assets, about a location, everything to do with that. Um, system of record, these are the places where businesses actually keep their promises. So if you order something, this is the place that manages that order processing. So very transactional based systems and then the system of insight is the miracle occurs here this is how we you know how difficult that is to actually merge all that data that's what's happening inside these systems of, of, of insight and actually the data is going backwards and forwards between these different systems now <coughs> about 15 years ago there was a lot of discussion about something called autonomic computing and this was recognizing the complexity that's going on behind all these systems 
and saying that systems need to be self-configuring, self-healing. This is where we actually need to start pushing the AI down into the infrastructure to allow that, um, to allow that uh, <coughs> um, communication, you know, to, 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 to allow the systems to start really um, taking a lot of the burden of managing the complexity off of the, um, off of the administration team, the operations team. Um, and we started doing this, but we gave up. And um, I think this is going to be an area that is going to have to revive because everything you see and you look at the complexity, you realize that this was the right answer. It was just a little bit too early. Um, but I think increasingly we have the capacity um, to start providing uh, many of these, these capabilities. And, and systems can sort of do it on their own. I mean, we have databases that tune themselves. We have um, our laptops and things now will manage their patches and updates um, automatically behind the scenes. You can start to see these behaviors. Um, but we need a much more systematic approach, particularly in, in business environments. Now, a key part of enabling that, not just in the infrastructure, but also in the higher level programs and in the data management, is something called metadata. And, and this was mentioned right at the beginning. This is the descriptions of the things you have, the IT assets, the data, the programs, the network connections, the infrastructure and things. Um, and that is the data that this type of um, uh, capability runs off of. So it's not running off you know, accounts and uh, product descriptions, it's running off of descriptions of our IT infrastructure. Um, and for all of this, it's providing what we call context. Um, and so it tells you what is the significance of this piece of data. So if I asked you a question, a very simple question that you know the answer to, where do you live? It will depend on who's asking you, will depend on the answer that you give. So if you're standing in, I don't know, Disneyland in the US, and someone says, where do you live? You say the UK. If you're standing in the street that you live in, and someone asks, where do you live? You say over there. So that's a very simple question, two completely different answers, all based on the context. So as we connect things together and move things around, one of the key things is how do we maintain the context of the original data, the actual element, the, reason, the, the, the thinking behind the way the code is written in a certain way. That's what the metadata is there for, is to provide the context around, around the data itself. Um, and today, of course, this is not there. This is not something we've actually built out and, and thought through. Um, but it's something that um, is increasingly uh, people are aware of as an issue. Uh, realize it's a big problem that we need to tackle and um, um, and you start to see standards forming around metadata now in fact we've done so well on standards that there are thousands of standards for metadata in terms of how we structure things but they're all too tiny they're not big enough to make describe how an ecosystem will work and so we need to stitch these standards together and um, and start creating models of how systems should operate and be autonomic together as a part of that. So the project that I'm doing is called Open Metadata and it's a tiny part of this. This is really just focused on the metadata we need around information and how to govern that information, make sure that as it moves in, uh, between systems it actually maintains its context around it. Now one of the things that's incredibly important about metadata is to remember that people are really bad at it. So this is the paper I wrote. And then when you look at the metadata for the paper, you can see I didn't fill it in because I never do. And most of us never do. We're absolutely dreadful. So metadata that people provide is often wrong. Um, but if you look at the paper itself, you can see that I actually do have my name in it. Uh, there's uh, author information, there's abstracts, there's keywords and stuff. It's all inside the document. What we need to do is an automated process to bring it out and put it into a standard structure so it can be shared. Here's a group of people who've managed to do this, which is when we look at digital photography. Um, when you take a digital photograph, the camera gathers metadata about the setting of the lens, the light levels, um, you know, the location of the photograph, all those sorts of things. And then when you take that photograph and you put it into a program, even if it's from a different manufacturer, that program understands that metadata. 
um, and you can add to it and then put in another program and the metadata moves. So the standards around this and the implementation of those standards is good enough that we can actually move digital photographs between different systems and, uh, and have different analysis processes on them. We need to do this to all data, not just, not just photographic. But the key to this is it's automated, it's gathered at source, and it flows with the data. Anything else is just really not going, going, to, going to cut it. So that's the work that I'm doing with, on Apache Atlas, is defining these standards, creating the open source components, the adapters, the, the flows, the interchange protocols to allow this for more generically across data. And then the hope is that we'll work with different vendors to actually start to get this embedded into the platforms. Um, and so, and the other thing is that we can't assume there's one big database that's got all the metadata in it. We need metadata repositories to be able to communicate as data flows between systems. And so this um, piece, as I say, it's a small part of the bigger problem, um, but it's also a big piece of work. It's gonna take years to actually transform the industry um, and enable that to do, but it's certainly an area um, of research and if we do it we'll create a whole new level of innovation because we're not spending a lot of time um, trying to describe data that's already you know being created we'll be able to work off of the metadata and make better use of the data that's that's connected around it so that's a piece in a piece in progress and we'll be able to create much greater governance around around the data which is becoming increasingly important so 40 years ago we were coding payroll systems and accounting systems. They were in back offices. They didn't impact people's lives. Today, we're programming things that control the train system, the road system, the uh, everyday lives, the, uh, you know, our phones are controlling our lives. And so it becomes increasingly important that the way systems work, the way data is collected, um, the way data is used, the way it's shared, is much more transparent to the people that are involved in, in using and for well, creating and using this data. So governance is something that is beginning to impact society or a lack of governance. And so people are going to start asking us questions about how we're building these systems and what are the ethical uses of this technology because it will start to impact people's lives. And you hear a lot more about, about ethics um, often associated with data, but it's a processing as well. Um, so there's a new regulation that's coming into force next May called the General Data Protection Regulation. And that says you are not allowed to process personal data, and that is any data about people in any way, which includes the device ID of um, someone's mobile phone, unless you have permission from that person, right? That is incredibly difficult. That's any piece of processing um, it impacts how what you can share, what you can receive, and the definition of personal data is absolutely huge. It's most of what we have. So that is going to change the way we need to think about processing in order to manage this metadata, which is the consent associated with it. You can think of it as the license, effectively, to process this data, but it's going down to record-by-record record licensing, not data set licensing. So this is going to be a huge challenge for the industry. Most businesses are thinking about it, but they're too late in many respects to actually start affecting the change that's needed. So um, there's going to be a massive panic um, next year. And I would say probably, you know, there, there, there are going to be quite a few businesses struggling with this regulation when it comes into force. Um, <coughs> what else have we got? Okay, so... I've talked an awful lot about data, partly because that's my area at the moment, but also it's the area we neglect the most. We focus so much on processing, we try to hide data. Actually, it should be a first-class citizen in all of our data, in all of our system designs, because the ability to share and use it outside of its original context is, is absolutely critical in today's, in today's world. So data is, is, uh, is a major pain point that we have, um, and uh, plenty, of, plenty of room for research, I would say. So the next and final quarter is really about people. And I mentioned this before, but you know, we are beginning to become part of everybody's life and every aspect of everybody's life as things become digitized. The impact of that is an increasing part of our lives is generating data. And they're generating data from a common set of infrastructure. The internet, for example, 
is a common platform. We're all using browsers to do a wide range of things, and those browsers are collecting data about us with a unique ID, which is the browser ID or our mobile phone ID. So the correlation becomes easier because you've now got this common identifier. What is very difficult to do is to actually understand the real meaning of it. So when you look up something on Amazon, do you want to buy it or are you buying it for a friend or you just want to know what it is? Um, and so, you know, these systems still make mistakes because they don't understand your intent as they're moving it forward. But, you know, we are seeing um, an awful lot of linking of data from things, processes that are actually completely different parts of our lives. Um, and this is the, an aspect that I think is, is again, an area that, that, that needs a, some, some improvement in, in terms of how we manage that segmentation of people's lives and data about people. Um, obviously, we need to um, think about uh, the security side of this. And security is a huge area and a huge concern in so many of our businesses. And this is not just about user IDs and passwords and encrypting and locking down systems. This is about also who we're sharing with, what, who else is observing the data as it's moving around. Um, and, um, and, and the reality is, of course, and none of our um, technology is particularly bad. It's all about its use. And it's used particularly as it's so easy now to target somebody. And it's not just about understanding them and, and uh, maybe um, hearing about something that's a little bit, um, you know, that, that they would consider private. It's the fact that you can interrupt them in their daily life. You can send them a text. And if this is abused, people are going to turn it off. So if you imagine you're getting a text message every minute continuously, what are you going to do? You're going to turn that messaging off. So if, if it's abused, we will lose it because it will just become unusable. So, so there's, then, there needs to be a lot of thought about when is it appropriate to interrupt somebody as they're in the middle of their, their, their thing. So, for example, if you walk into a shop, you might now get a voucher from one of their competitors to say, don't shop here, come and shop with me and I'll give you 10% off. Sounds good. Could be a bit annoying if it's done too much. So this is, this is the area that really needs a huge amount of thought. Um, and as I say, the reason is that we're doing so much on one device and there's no way for us to segregate our contacts for work, our contacts for um, our family, our contacts for our health, etc. on these platforms. It's just all lumped together. And it means it's very, very hard. In society, we represent different personas to different people and we have sort of the people who we trust and are very close to us and we tell them a lot. And then people who have strangers, we tell a, a small amount. Um, and again, we need some way in our systems to actually allow these spheres to be represented in the way that people work with systems. And then finally, the consent. So here's a system logging on. The computer says, who are you? I'm Fred, and here's my password. The computer says, oh, yes, OK, I recognize you, so you can now do this. And then the person comes back and says, that's great, but I would like um, to set some ground rules on what you can do with my data. And that's really what the GDPR is trying to do, is to allow people some control over what the system does on their behalf, how they share and manage data. And again, again quite a different paradigm to uh, the, log on, uh, the log on sequence. Um, and then we have different scenarios where we have to think about how we gather the consent from people. So easy one, I, I'm logging onto my account, my profile, I'm, I can be asked consent for the use of my data at that point. Similarly in terms of do I mind having my activity captured so a product can be improved on my behalf. What about my car? When I'm driving my car, how do I give the car manufacturer consent for all the data they're collab collecting about? where I'm going, my driving skills, how often I crash, all that sort of thing is in some respects not necessarily their business, but the car knows an incredible amount about exactly what we do with our lives. So how do we capture and maintain consent in those sorts of environments? And then probably the hardest one at all is when somebody has a data set, so this is a customer list from a particular business, and they load it and start processing it. Each row is a different person and they need, we need consent for every row in order to process it. And how do we manage that when so many people have Excel on their laptop and can move data around 
um, and use it in different ways. So plenty of challenges in around um, consent and privacy. Um, and for many businesses, uh, when I talk to them about this, I say your attitude shows on your website. So um, a few years ago, there was a new law about cookies and you had to get permission to use cookies. Um, and it was fascinating to see how different companies approached it. Um, so some were really very polite. It's that we'd like to use cookies, may we? So it was by default off and you could turn it on. There's a BBC here basically saying, uh, we're going to turn, we've, got, we've got cookies turned on, but this is how you turn it off. The next one is, um, uh, uh, well, the colour should tell you which company this was. Um, the um, basically says, we're using cookies, and if you don't like it, go elsewhere. Um, and then the worst is, well, you know, there's, everybody's doing it, so we're not going to even tell you that we're doing it. Um, now, what does that tell you about the attitude to your data from those companies? Um, and increasingly, um, people are switching away from organisations that are actually can't be trusted to manage their data um, and really don't give them control. Um, and you'll see increasingly um, privacy policies being updated and different stances being taken by different companies on how data is used. Um, so it, it is becoming a competitive issue around, um, around the way that data is, is, is protected. Um, and and, and um, the way that uh, people are approached about their data. So what are we trying to do when it comes to people? In order to build their trust, we need to protect their data, be transparent about what we're doing, um, and also be reliable. So when the systems, when I need the system, it's there and it, it's available. And that's all about how you build trust on, under a system. Um, so the user interface is not just about colors and layout. It really is about the way that the data and the way that the system that you perceive as a user is, is actually working and operating and, uh, um, and, and providing you service, but also um, making use of the data that you create. And so many of our services, they're free, and people are used to having free services. But of course, you know if the service is free, you all have the product. And it's your data is the thing that's actually paying for the, the function that you have. So how do you manage that environment when you, when you have that? So that's the final one. Um, I hope that's given you a feel for how things have changed over the years. The, the driver has been the infrastructure, but actually that infrastructure has created greater capacity, which has led to a skill shortage. It's led to the need to create higher and higher levels of abstraction for our programming languages. Um, these abstractions have created inefficient systems, but also a fragmentation of data. However, organizations need to create a single view of themselves and a single view of their customers and operate coherently and legally. And all of that then is requiring the data to be pulled together. Um, as we pull data together, we take it out of its protective environment. That protective environment um, needs, <coughs> actually tells you the context, it tells you the quality, um, and it provides protection for private and uh, sensitive information. Uh, so we need to start building systems that allow that data to move. Um, and as we start doing this, we increase the use of the, the infrastructure and the whole process cycles around again. Um, again, we said, as I said at the beginning, this is a fascinating industry. It's constantly changing. We're being so successful. I think it's questions, yes. We are being so successful. But that success is something that we need to manage responsibly um, and um, computer scientists, if you think about, we used to do everything. We used to do, you know, if you were in computing, you did the system top to bottom. As the, um, the programming languages become easier to use, there are more and more people programming who aren't computer scientists because they're doing these very high level, simple choreographing, pressing buttons, selecting options, and building websites and all sorts of things as a result. So what is computing? It's not about programming systems top to bottom. It's about providing that enablement, that enablement for many people to make good use and um, benefit from technology um, as we go through. And increasingly, we're going to be raising the level of instruction above the hardware, allowing hardware to uh, change and grow underneath, but the system integrity to be maintained in the metadata, the data, and, and, and the processing around it. And that's, a, that's something that 
you know, that we've been striving to do over many years, but the, the, the power is really there nowadays to create this consistency across, across our systems. What else? Yeah, blowing the barrier, maintain, managing complexity, and basically bringing good ideas such as the autonomic computing to light once we have the capability and the capacity in the industry um, to support it. That's it. Questions? <laughs> Questions, anybody? <laughs> right. Thank you. That was a very wonderful presentation. So I have a question about going to sell a short story. So it's my first time in the UK, but when I first arrived, I wanted to go shop for grocery, and then I don't know where or how to get there. So I used Google Maps, and I realized two weeks later, I checked the same store, and I saw just below the Google Maps direction. You were here two weeks ago. Okay. So I was, I'm just curious, with the rate at which data is being collected and managed now, is, should we be worried about our privacy? I mean, what's your opinion? Um, so I think we need to take, be interested in it. The question is, we're always paying, well, so it may be useful to know that you were there two weeks ago, and so that you think, well, that's actually quite nice to know. I have, I have come back to the same place or whatever. So there's lots of value in that. But the question is, at what point do you need to be able to turn that off? And I think the thing that frightens people most is the fact that you don't know that that data is being gathered. Um, and it's only when it's used that you start to realize, oh, actually, I'm a bit unhappy about that. So one of the things that happens a lot to people is if you use, um, so my, this is my own Mac, I use it for work and home. If I'm, say, browsing and I'm shopping at the weekend on the, on the internet, on Monday morning when I go into work and I go to a work website, there's an advert for the thing I was browsing at the weekend. And this is, means that my dif different parts of my lives are being blurred together. So I think on one hand, we need the ability to break to actually create walls between different parts of our lives. Um, and, that's, and that does impact our privacy. The other is I think we need a better way to understand what's happening with our data, because most of the time it's valuable, it's useful, um, and it's a good thing. It's just not knowing. And, you know, and, and it might come to pass and in the future there's some collection of data that stops you getting a job, because um, this employer doesn't allow people who've been to this place. Or you, know, you shop. You always shop at Tesco, so Sainsbury's won't give you a job. This is when the, that, that data becomes a problem because it's stopping you doing what you should be doing for a reason that, that seems, um, you know, seems it, it, irrelevant. Um, does, it, does that help? Yeah. yeah. It does. Maybe I'll put up my location <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> it is worth looking at your laptop and seeing how many apps are using your location. Because a lot of games that are free to download are there just to gather data about you. They're not to provide you with the game. The game is the, the thing to get you to download. And you look in the privacy settings, and you're absolutely astound it's absolutely astounding how many um, app, uh, you know, solitaire applications need to track your location. Why do they need to track your location? Because they're selling it. <laughs> that's paying for the programmer. So that's the thing you do need to watch, is that uh, there are many things that, particularly anything that's free, you are the you are the product. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. So, my name is Adrian Smills. Uh, I'm uh, doing a PhD in health informatics. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a previous life, uh, I was the head of IT for the Natural History Museum uh, in London. And one of the things that we built was a very very large uh, dams, digital asset management system, mm -hmm. uh, including the Tree of Life. Mm -hmm. Some of the solutions that you uh, alluded to would be solved if you delved into how the, the semantic. Uh, connections within the tree of life are mm -hmm. actually constructed. The ontologies and the taxonomies that they use are directly applicable to a great deal of the solutions that you've, you, you've mm -hmm. identified as being problems. Mm -hmm. So the solutions do exist. Uh, one of the other things that um, you've uh, mentioned is uh, the complexity of metadata mm -hmm. and how to connect into it and you create this big pool. That's not necessary anymore. There's technology that I'm helping bring over from the US that's been deployed where we just point uh, the, the system to, to lots of different data sources and treat it all as text, we can mine it. And the magic source within that uh, that we look um, for patterns 
and we treat everything as text. But what we also do is use dictionaries to look for similarities within different words. So if you create a word, I'm looking for a shiny gun, we use the word substitute chrome, uh, we substitute silver, uh, and it brings all of the same information back across the different sets of databases. So data lakes, not necessarily. Uh, so there were several points there, and I'm going to argue with you on every single one. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, so I'll, and I'll forget all four, I know I will by the time we get to it. So there are, um, so ontologies, yes, and they're definitely in use. The big problem we have with ontologies is um, their accuracy, and we find that once an ontology goes beyond a single person's ability to understand it, people lose faith in it because it, 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 um, it, it starts to do, this inferencing becomes um, difficult to understand. So, that, I yeah. Tell so you don't. We do. Because the evidence in this particular domain is exactly and 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 in a domain, yes. And and the trouble is that we can take a specific domain and we can build an ontology for it. But there are many many domains of data that don't have an ontology. So definitely, I've worked on systems that use ontologies. They work within a restricted domain, um, but they don't work generically. Um, so we need more ontologies around it. But if you're trying to create an ontology for the whole of human knowledge, um, it's too big to understand. Um, do uh, they don't, actually. Uh, they don't, no, they don't. They, they are a system about libraries and digital media. They're not about the content of them. No, no, they are. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so let's, let's move on to these other things. So there are many, many vendors who produce the ability to suck in data into a central database. Um, the problem is every vendor has their own format, um, and the standards are very, very tightly um, contained. So we have a billion dollar business on doing this, right? It's not good enough. And the reason it's not good enough is it doesn't matter how good we make it, we have a competitor who's got another one, and our customers have bought both, right? Um, and so every time someone buys a new product, a um, new one of these, they have to load all the metadata into that central repository, and it's very, very expensive. So what we're trying to do is to allow these to have a standard format so that we can exchange it. So, so you're absolutely right, these systems exist, but they're isolated and limited um, in terms of how they can be and how they can be done. Um, so I've done three and I've forgotten the fourth one. Uh, data lakes, I think. Oh, data lakes. So why do we bring data together into a data lake? Many, many operations, that, there are abilities to call data remotely. Uh, when you call data remotely, you put an impact on the source system. And many source systems are running at 89, 90% capacity, and they actually can't take the initial query load on them. So that's one reason why we don't do it. They're not always available. Sometimes they ha many have to be shut down for backups and that sort of thing. And so the data lake provides continuous availability of that data. And many systems don't maintain enough history um, they only keep the current values, um, and so you end up pulling it. So, as, as I said before, all of information management is about non-functional requirements. And the reason we build data lakes is largely the inability of the source to support the queries. Maybe the structure's not the same. It's, it's, it's at that cost. It's the source system's capability that causes us to create data lakes. It's not a lack of metadata. So... Um, so, it's, so everything you said is true in a small domain. It's not generically true. Uh, well, I think my point was that you can take those particular, uh, uh, those particular um, uh, abstractions and apply them to different domains. Oh, and we do, and we do. And none of these are new, exactly as you said. We do this a lot. We've been doing this for many, many years in many organizations. The thing is that um, the reason that we need to do this in open source, the reason that we need to create open standards, is it's got to become ubiquitous. And it isn't ubiquitous. Well, I agree with that. Open standards yeah. are less open. Yeah. Proprietary standards are, are, are very accurate. Yes, that's right. And that's, that's really where we are with it. So you're right. There's not, it's not very <laughs> <friendly. laughs> So. Let's move back. Sorry. Um, you can carry on your argument. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hello. Thank you for a nice presentation. My as well. So I used to be a BI developer before that using, I think, the, the uh, IBM tool like uh, Kronos and Informatica. Okay. 
So the issue is, I think the issue of the quality is ongoing issue. Is we never really stop it. I mean, the hundred percent of it. But the new type of data, like the untracked data format, the text menu, I think it's really give a challenges to us to solve. So, what's your opinion on this? On how we want to solve the quality issue, but with the new challenge that I think is possible to solve and without making too many effort for the decision maker. So what we do is we, um, so the first thing we do with unstructured data is we turn it into structured. So we parse it and we extract keywords and information about it so that um, we can then use structured processing on it. Um, and that's one of the things that, that, that does happen in a data lake is that you bring in the raw unstructured data, say Twitter feeds or um, emails or documents or whatever. And then we run a parser over it to, say, extract a certain type of information that's then feeding in another process that would be used somewhere else. Um, and then we might have a different parser that extracts a different type of information. Um, and so what's valuable in a data lake is typically we, run, we, we, we store the data in raw format and then we, we map multiple different schemas over it to allow different types of data to be extracted. And we keep that raw data so that we can write new parsers for new business problems as they come along. Um, so yeah, it uses different engines, um, but often we're, we're actually bringing the data into a format that can then be picked up by these more traditional tools um, going forward. Yeah. OK. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, in the structure you are talking about where all the metadata is integrated. Um, for example, places like Amazon use this kind of metadata in order to suggest before what uh, what would be interesting for them to buy. Yes. Um, but th there are people that maybe can go out of control buying things. Is there any kind of like, control system that might uh, uh, this uh, population might benefit that would restrict their purchases, for example. <laughs> Do you have a problem? Norm normally, <laughs> normally the thing that restricts what you buy is to say the size of your bank account, <laughs> and and so that is our control. Actually, it's the financial system that sits beyond it. It's it's a very the question behind it is very interesting. At what point? Do you save people from themselves? And do you stop people doing what they want? And that's actually why we have uh, government and things like that, because it's incredibly important decision that a society makes that says what people can and can't do. Um, and in some point, you have to, you know, it's really, it's much more of a question that should be asked to, uh, um, you know, social scientists, I think, rather than a computer scientist, except for the fact that we're challenged with that today as we design systems. You know, what do we allow? Um, when do we allow somebody who's under 18 to access a particular service? Or, um, you know, how much do we allow, if you're building a gambling system, how much do you allow people to lose in a single night? All those sorts of things. But actually, as computer scientists, we shouldn't solve those problems. We should pass them to the stakeholder, the owner of the system, because it's the business's choice, really, in terms of where that decision lies. Um, as engineers, we have some ethical, you know, I wouldn't want to build a system that deliberately harms people or deliberately exploits people. I just wouldn't want to work on a system like that. But there are often many, many decisions within ordinary code that actually need a business to say, how do you want your brand to appear? How do you want to treat your customers in terms of their data? And it can be very, very simple. So you imagine a system, and this is probably relevant to you, that allows somebody's courtesy title to be doctor. And then you're taking that data and you're putting it into a system that doesn't allow doctor. It's Mr, Mrs or Miss. What do you change that to when you bring the data over? That's actually a policy decision. That's not, a, it's not something, as computer scientists, we can answer that question. Um, unless you've got gender, you're going to be wrong, <laughs> OK? And even if you've got gender, you still might be wrong because Individuals have their own preferences in terms of the courtesy title that applies to them. And in some countries, you know, there are hundreds of courtesy titles. So, you know, even very simple um, actions impact people 
Um, and I think apart from being aware of when that's happening, um, it's not really our responsibility to get the answer, it's the owner of the system that needs to answer that type of question. Did that make sense? Good. It's course past 11, so I think it's time for our coffee break, but please join me in thanking Mandy once again.